the Nova Science Cafe. Uh, so um, this is brought to you by uh, the UAB uh, CNC or Comprehensive Neuroscience Center. So what's, what's the CNC? It's really a network of uh, more than 500 neuroscience research faculty, clinician, staff, student, and trainee. And a membership is comprised of neuroscientists who are, com are coming from 30 different departments and nine schools. So it really serves as a focal uh, point for basic and applied neuroscience research at UAB. So, so we are, what is really important to understand is that the neuroscientists are all over uh, the school, uh, among different departments and, and different schools. So we created this uh, neuroscience cafe to uh, share with the community the science that is generated uh, at UAB in, in the field of the, neuros the neuroscience. So it's a, the cafe is a monthly community commitment designed to bring neuroscientists and clinicians together to discuss human research and knowledge on various topics in neuroscience. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, I'm Adrian Lati, I'm the director of the CNC, I'm a professor and I'm chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurobiology. Uh, the co-director is Lucas Pozomiller, who is right now in the audience is a professor in the Department of Neurobiology. And then uh, associate director is Lauren Sinsich, who is a faculty member in the Department of Optometry and Vision Science in the School of Optometry, and is also among our uh, participants today. So we are really excited to uh, have this uh, cafe uh, whose stem is around autism in Alabama. So we have two fabulous uh, speakers today. We have uh, Cassandra Newsom and Rajat Kana. So I'm going to give you a little bit of their background. I'm going to read actually. Uh, so Dr. Newsom is a licensed clinical psychologist and she's an associate professor in uh, uh, neurobiology, in the department of neurobiology but she's also the director of the Neurodevelopmental Disabilities Translational Research Corps at the Civitan International Research Center, which is also UAB. She has dedicated uh, research and clinical work to autism, uh, associated rare genetic disorders, and other neurodevelopmental disabilities for the past 16 years at a position at Virginia Beach City Public School at Vanderbilt Medical Center at, and at the University of Texas uh, Southwestern. She has expertise in diagnosis and neuropsychological evaluation of children with developmental differences and has contributed to multiple research projects over her career. At UEB, she's developing a patient research database and bank of biological samples with the goal of connecting researchers clinician and families to promote cutting edge translational research in neurodevelopmental disabilities. So uh, Rajat Kana, Dr. Kana is a professor at the University of Alabama in the Department of Psychology, is the director of the Center for Innovative Research in Autism. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychology at UAB, where he, has, he was for a long time. Uh, Dr. Kana's interest focuses on basic and translational research on the neurobiology of autism. He, he uses um, a variety of brain imaging techniques such as functional MRI, structural MRI, diffusion weighted imaging or DWI, and MR spectroscopy to understand the function and anat anatomical organization of the brain in autism. Uh, he studies social cognition, language comprehension, executive function, and the impact of behavioral intervention on the brain in children and adults with autism. Dr. Kana received his PhD in uh, psycholinguistic from the Indian Institute of Technology in uh, New Delhi, India, 
And as a Fulbright fellow, he learned neuroimaging at UCLA. And if that was followed by a postdoc training in using neuroimaging method to study autism spectrum disorder at Carnegie Mellon University of, in Pittsburgh. So this is for today, but I also want to advertise our next um, neuro neuroscience cafe. We, have, we really have exciting cafe coming to you. In March, on the 18th, Dr. Karen Gamble and Justin Thomas will speak about sleep and circadian rhythm during a pandemic. A special event. On April 15, we'll have Dr. Jeannie Marazzo and Dr. K uh, David Kimberland, who are, who are going to give us update on COVID, where we are with testing, treatment, and vaccination. We hope to, uh, to have a lot of people, uh, and especially the people who are still um, unsure about whether they should be vaccinated or not. And then on May uh, 20th, we will have uh, Dr. David Knight and Dr. Amy Knight, who are uh, going to discuss uh, anxiety and stress disorder following traumatic medical events. So what we want to uh, do is to ask questions and as mentioned uh, on this slide, there will be a recording of this presentation that will be available at your local library, but can also be accessed on the CNC uh, website. So without further ado, I'm going to turn to our first um, speaker, and that would be um, Cassandra Newsom. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm gonna just pull up my presentation quickly. Okay. So um, I'm going to kind of try to give a little bit of background about some of the clinical aspects of autism tonight and tell you a little bit about some of our initiatives at the Civitan International Research Center. Um, there's a lot of information to cover. So if there's things that I kind of glance over that you find really interesting and want to know more about, then I hope you will ask me questions and um, we can dig deeper into the things that you find interesting. Um, one of my uh, favorite quotes by um, an autism self-advocate named Temple Grandin is that different thinking is where progress and invention and discoveries lie. Um, I think that we have um, a significant amount um, to learn from people who are neuroatypical, which is how self-advocates sometimes refer to themselves, um, to their brains work differently. They perceive the world in some ways differently. Um, but in many ways, um, we're all the same. And so um, I think there are potential for some really amazing discoveries by understanding um, the differences in autism. Um, I'm a neuropsychologist by training um, and neuropsychologists study and measure behaviors to tell us about the functioning of the brain. So, um, Early in, in neuropsychology, we would document lesions um, that we saw and, and then would see the kind of result of those behaviors. And then other times we documented the behaviors to infer where a lesion might be located in the brain. So before we had the technology to do imaging and things like that, this is how we learned um, what different parts of the brain were for or for their function. So many of you may have heard of Phineas Gage. Um, he was um, one of the uh, a famous person in the history of, of um, neuropsychology and understanding how the brain worked. Um, when working on the railroad, a railroad spike um, went through one of his eyes and into his um, brain and out the back. And he um, did not lose consciousness, they think, and um, was able to go to the doctor and said, here's enough business for you, doctor. Um, and. Uh, um, so it was one of the ways that we started to learn about what the function of the brain was. How was his personality different? All the things that were preserved and continued to work just fine, his ability to speak and to communicate and to walk and his motor behaviors, but there was a change in his personality and his executive functioning skills. 
um, his ability to inhibit his behavior and plan and organize. Um, and I think uh, we have um, this history of using a typical brain functioning to understand typical brain functioning. Um, and as I said, I think autism really holds the promise to teach us much about how our genetics and environment and development interplay to drive brain development um, and make us who we are. Um, and now thankfully we have technologies that are much more advanced um, to study brain functioning. And you're gonna hear about some of those things this evening. So I wanna tell you the, I'm having trouble getting this to, there we go. Um, some, just some basic facts about autism. So autism is a developmental difference that can cause um, social communication and behavioral changes. Um, some people with autism spectrum disorders need a lot of supports in their daily lives. Um, they may have significant cognitive impairments or communication impairments um, where other people with autism spectrum disorders need um, much fewer supports or different kinds of supports um, and may be um, living and working in the community, um, in jobs, right in the next, next to you, um, in your college classes. Um, so autism is a very broad spectrum, spectrum um, with a lot of variability in the things that are strengths and weaknesses for people with autism. It occurs in all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. Oops, sorry. Um, um, it, the most recent prevalence estimates we have are about one in 54 people um, will have an autism spectrum disorder. Um, diagnosis of autism is about four times more common in boys than among girls. Um, and the diagnosis of autism has been increasing um, steadily over the last five decades. Um, we don't know all of the reasons for that increase, um, but it's a very fascinating area of study we're looking at all different kinds of things, pollution, um, maternal and paternal age at time of conception, maternal um, infection, prematurity. Um, there seems to be that there's, there's definitely not just one cause of autism, but there seems to be lots of different factors that increase risk for autism. Those are environmental, biological, genetic, um, and we're starting to try to understand how those things interplay with each other. Um, there seems to be a critical period for developing autism that occurs before, during, and immediately after birth. It's a time of, of course, rapid brain development, um, and this is a developmental um, disorder. Um, so what are we looking for when we're making a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder, or when we're trying to recognize autism? So. Children or adults with autism might have, are definitely going to have trouble with their social communications. It's not just about their speech, um, being able to use words and vocabulary and sentences, it's about the total packet of communication. Um, so they might not point at objects or show interest or look at objects when another person points at them. They might avoid eye contact or have trouble integrating eye contact. Um, they might have trouble understanding or recognizing other people's feelings or talking about their own feelings. Um, they may be very interested in people but not know how to talk or play or relate to them. They may have trouble expressing their needs using typical words or body language. Um, I think it's important to think about all the ways that we communicate and regulate our relationships um, and our social interactions. We use our eye contact. Um, we may look away if we're um, um, uncomfortable with something or embarrassed. We might shift our gaze to get someone to look in a certain direction. Um, we use our hands and our gestures and our body language, our facial expressions. Um, and people with autism spectrum disorder sometimes are less likely to use some of these strategies. They also um, may have more trouble integrating and reading all of those kinds of nonverbal types of communication in other people. Um, I think it's, a, it's definitely a myth that some people um, have that people with autism aren't interested in other people, are interested in relationships, and that's not the case. 
Um, some people with autism have had, um, because of their difficulty reading social situations, may have had failed so experiences in social situations, which increases anxiety. And we all try to avoid situations that are hard or difficult or, or uncomfortable. Um, and uh, people with autism can also sometimes get stuck on certain topics and have trouble shifting their attention between things and people. So it may not be they're not interested in other people, but once they get focused, sometimes they can get very narrowly focused. And it's where we tend to, neurotypical people tend to shift their attention very frequently and um, will show a preference for social kinds of um, information and will shift to, to check in and to, to gain that kind of information. Sometimes people with autism will get um, more narrowly focused and kind of stuck. Um, on um, certain topics and certain activities. It can also be a strength if you really need to focus on something and you need to gain lots of facts and information about it. And um, it can make you um, really skilled in certain areas um, and um, be a really fantastic employee. Um, people with autism also show what we call restricted and repetitive behavior. So they might echo or repeat words or phrases. Um, they may struggle with pretend kind of play or play with toys in a different type of way, um, in a more physical way or repetitive way. They may repeat certain actions, may have repetitive motor um, behaviors. Um, as I said, they can have narrow and strong interests. They may have trouble adapting sometimes when routines change. Um, um, it can cause anxiety when things are not predictable and they um, process sensory information um, differently. That can look different for each, each person. For some people, they um, may be acutely sensitive to certain sensations, uh, like a hypersensitivity. Some cases, they may be under responsive to certain sensations or need more sensory input from the environment and seek out additional sensory information. Um, there's no medical test, like a blood test or a scan to diagnose autism, um, which can make it very tricky um, for children um, to get a diagnosis um, and to get appropriate treatment early on. So the diagnosis is made instead by looking at a child's behavior and development to make a diagnosis. Kind of like I was talking about neuropsychologists in the early days when we um, looked at behavior to try to understand um, the functioning of the brain and where things might be going wrong. Um, autism is kind of still at that stage. So we, um, our testing involves interacting with a child or with an adult, um, doing different play activities and conversational activities um, where we're able to observe how they communicate socially, how they respond, um, and how they interact with their environment. Um, so autism can sometimes be detected um, at 18 months or younger. And um, I routinely see children in that age range. By age two, uh, a diagnosis by an experienced professional is usually accurate and stable. Um, however, many children do not receive a final diagnosis until they're much older. And this is a big problem in our field. And um, a real focus of research is how do we detect autism at its, as early as possible so that we can get children um, into the intervention that they need while their brains are still growing and developing at such a rapid rate. So some research by the CDC found that 85% of children with ASD had concerns about their development documented in their medical records, either from their parent or their pediatrician by three years of age. Um, but frequently there was a big lag between that first concern when their parents first said something seems not quite right with their development to when they actually got a developmental evaluation. And that's, uh, there's a multitude of reasons for that. Um, some recent research found that only 4% of children who received a positive screen were referred for what we suggest is the next step when you're a child that age is having developmental concerns. Um, to go to early intervention, to have their hearing screened, and to have a developmental evaluation. Um, our goal is really to bring the age of diagnosis down, and it is going down, but um, it's still around four years, four months on average. Um, the, we found that the CDC found that fewer than half of children with ASD received a developmental evaluation by three years of age. Um, 
which is really our goal. So the process that happens um, is uh, children are, um, the American um, Pediatric Association recommends that children be screened at their well child visits. So not when their parents are just coming in because of concerns, but even when they're just coming in for their um, checkups at 18 and 24 months of age, um, pediatricians are supposed to screen for um, any differences in their development. Um, one of the tools that they use is the MCHAT. Um, it's free and you can look at it online. Um, some other, I think, helpful um, materials and websites. Um, if you're concerned about a child's development or you want to monitor a child's development, um, is the CDC now has a milestone tracker app. Oh, there's an app for everything. Um, so it will tell you what kinds of things your child is expected to do at a certain age and alert you if there are things that um, are deviating from the normal in their development. Um, also, the First Words Project is a really great website as well, where you can go and it tells you what kinds of um, developmental milestones are expected in multiple different areas, and in particular, social communication, um, and has some great videos and visuals that show you what those behaviors actually look like. Um, if a child screens positive on a developmental screen by a pediatrician, um, as I said, then the next step would be to refer them for a developmental evaluation where we go through a diagnostic process, um, the interactive play-based type of assessment, um, and then make referrals for therapy from that point. Um, there are not enough um, trained providers to um, meet the demand for diagnoses. So um, the, there are long wait list um, at almost every center and hospital across the country um, for diagnostic evaluations for children, which is one of the other reasons why um, the age at diagnosis has not come down as far as we would like for it to. Um, the treatments for autism include things like applied behavior analysis, um, speech therapy, occupational therapy, educational interventions, feeding therapy is often um, a part of that, and social skills training. So applied behavior analysis, I tell parents it's not about bad behavior, it is a system of teaching um, that uh, developed in a lab um, where um, um, tasks are broken down into very small steps. Um, the tasks are repeated multiple times. So there's lots of repetition and there's lots of positive reinforcement that's given. And then those behaviors are chained back together to create more complex um, behaviors. And um, it has the best research so support so far for um, improving outcomes in children with an autism spectrum disorder. So um, we're trying to address the needs of um, families in Alabama um, who have uh, a child or with autism or who have autism themselves. Um, UAB Civitan Sparks is, um, a, provides clinical services to so those diagnostic services I was talking about um, for children four and above um, with concerns for autism. They also are training that next generation of providers um, to, um, to be able to provide services, therapy, and diagnostic services to um, children um, with concerns for development and concerns with autism. Um, Children's of Alabama has a developmental behavioral pediatrics program. Um, within that, we have a toddler autism um, clinic. Um, that's where I was today, um, was seeing children under the age of three with concerns for autism. Um, where we're able to see the children do a full evaluation and give feedback to families in the same day. It's about a four hour um, evaluation. So autism diagnosis is also difficult just because of the length of time it takes. Three year old, two and three year olds may take around four hours where a school age child or an adult um, because they have so much more history and they're more complex um, can, can take a, a two day visit or up to eight hours to make a diagnosis. Um, Regional autism networks are um, um, a feature in Alabama. There are, um, they're at several of our institutions, UAB and University of Alabama at Auburn, University of Southern um, Alabama and the University of Alabama at Huntsville. 
They provide parent and professional training. They connect families and professionals to regional resources. Um, Alabama also has an emergency autism coordinating council um, and there it brings together state agencies, providers, um, self-advocate families um, to develop a long-term plan of care for people with autism and make recommendations to the legislature and to the governor um, about um, how we can improve services for people with autism. And then there's where I work at the Civitan International Research Center. Um, and we house and support research in neurodevelopmental disabilities and a wide range of neurodevelopmental disabilities, not just autism. Um, so at the CRC, I'm working to um, try to grow uh, um, autism research and neurodevelopmental disability research at UAB. One of the ways we're doing that is through the Civitan Autism Neurodevelopmental Disability Research Database and Biorepository. So I'm going to skip over a couple of slides because I want to have time to talk about um, some other things. So um, some of the components that we're including is that diagnostic evaluation, gathering all of that behavioral data. Um, we call that behavioral phenotyping. Um, we also are gonna have a database that connects researchers to families and we're collecting biosamples. So I wanna tell you about a couple of the biosamples that we're planning to collect. Um, we're collecting blood samples for DNA and RNA analysis. So um, sometimes autism occurs in people who have certain genetic or chromosomal conditions like fragile X syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, Phelan McDermott syndrome. Um, but there's a huge genetic heterogeneity in autism. There isn't just one gene that accounts for all forms of autism. And when we started looking, we thought we might find, um, you know, 10, 15, 20, and instead we're finding hundreds of genes, um, multiple different types of genetic differences that infer risk for autism rather than there being um, a single cause. Um, we started to study each of these very small genetic changes to understand how they guide brain development. We're gonna be using whole genome sequencing to allow us to identify subgroups of people with autism by their genotype for further study. Um, we would be able then to go back and, and look at how they differ um, behaviorally and their symptoms and their um, medical um, conditions. Um, also, um, we have the potential to do that through animal modeling. So UAB has a precision animal modeling center. Now that can, um, if we identify a, a genetic difference in a child who has a neurodevelopmental difference, um, that animal, precision animal modeling clinic can take that genetic difference and model it in multiple different animal systems, which I think is very exciting. Um, we're also uh, collecting fecal samples. So you might ask why would we be collecting poop? Um, but studies have frequently found abnormal gut um, microbiome in individuals with an autism spectrum disorder, suggesting a link between the gut microbiome and autism-like behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, and modifying the gut microbiome is a potential route to improve gastrointestinal symptoms in children with autism, which is common, but also behavioral symptoms in children with autism. Um, we have the ability to do um, gene sequencing of fecal samples. Um, those samples could be used for a variety of purposes. One would be to be transplanted into germ-free mice. Um, studies have shown that when you take a fecal sample from um, some children with autism and you put it into an animal model, um, you will start to see autism-like behaviors in those animals. Um, there's also been some studies looking at um, using fecal transplant, so taking um, a fecal sample from a neurotypical person, putting it into a child who has an autism spectrum disorder, and they have started, they have seen in some cases a reduction in symptoms. Um, we're also looking at um, collecting baby teeth um, as a potential source of stem cells. Um, the reason we're thinking about baby teeth is because we can collect them at a time they naturally fall out. It's less invasive. So a lot of the ways, the typical ways you collect um, stem cells um, is through taking a, a, a sample of skin. Um, and you can imagine kids don't enjoy that. Um, stem cells are being utilized in autism research to generate brain organoids, which are models of human embryonic brain development. That can be used to study neurogenesis, um, cortical lamination in some cases, like how the brain is connecting at the synapse, neural circuit formation. Um, and they can also be used to screen 
a large number of potential drug treatments um, at one time and see how the brain might respond. Um, I'm gonna wrap up quickly. So these are some great websites I would recommend for more information about autism. In particular, I love Spectrum um, and follow them on social media. They um, provide frequent um, kind of a, a digest of all the current research in autism, um, a lot of neuroscience research, um, and they put it in a very digestible way. Um, and then you can go seek out the full article if you're, if you're really interested. Um, I would also recommend um, some of these books by people who have autism. Um, I think it can be um, a really interesting perspective to see autism from the eyes of a person who has autism rather than someone like me who is, who is talking about it as an outsider. Um, all of these books are great. Um, and this is our team at Candor, um, Dr. Powell, um, Elizabeth Garner, and myself. Um, and I look forward to answering some questions at the end. Thank you, uh, Cassandra. There's a question in the chat. And okay. the question is about which of these places that you were uh, mentioning previously diagnose and provide services for adults with autism. Yes. And so um, that is definitely um, an area of weakness. Um, we don't yet have um, a clinic serving adults at um, UAB. I believe there are services at the University of Alabama and Dr. Khanna may be able to speak more to that, definitely for serving um, college age students. One of the areas of research though that we're hoping to expand is is into um, adults with autism. So I hope that soon at um, the Civitan International Research Center, we'll be able to offer diagnostic services um, to adults with autism. Are there other questions? Uh, I, yeah, I have a question. Yes. Can you hear me okay? I can. So, so you were saying that um, one of your goals is to diagnose children before the age of four, I think was your, one of your goals? As early as possible. So we yeah. could, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, what, are you, what are you looking for? And what do you mostly see when you're evaluating those young children? Is there a common symptom profile? Yes. So um, problems with the way that they communicate. So um, for example, I might see the kinds of things I might do with a child to arrive at a diagnosis would be um, I might blow some bubbles with a bubble gun and watch for their reaction. Sometimes I will see repetitive behaviors. So they might be flapping their hands mm -hmm. or posturing or holding their bodies in unusual positions. They might make unusual vocalizations. So sometimes people with autism have trouble modulating the intonation of their voice. So I might hear some unusual or high pitched sounds. Mm -hmm. um, then I'll stop blowing the bubbles and wait and see um, how they ask for more of something that they really like and enjoy. Bubbles usually gets a big um, happy reaction, but then they sometimes have difficulty asking for more of it. So, wow. you know, a typically developing child would have lots of tools to be able to ask for more of something that they want. So they might say bubbles, they might say more, they might point at the, um, at the bubbles. They might just make eye contact with me and then look over at the bubbles and look back at me. They might smile really big while making eye contact. Um, they might go and use a gesture to show me that they want more bubbles. But children with autism, even though they en are enjoying the activity, don't have a way, um, an easy way to communicate and be able to coordinate all of those different aspects of communication to send a clear message. Does that oh, make sense? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, so we're doing very play-based. We've got fun toys that are interactive and bright and, and developmentally appropriate. We're seeing if they're using pretend play skills, how they respond when we try to join their play. So are they readily then letting us join in doing back and forth play or are they turning away from us and wanting to continue to play with the toy in the same way that they were before? Do they get stuck on toys? How hard is it to move them from one toy to a new toy? So they can uh, help now with those transitions. So we're throughout um, this kind of hour of play-based assessment with something called the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. We're looking for all of these multiple behaviors of social communication, restricted interest, repetitive behaviors, and sensory differences. 
Um, so yeah. are they, you know, licking the bubble wand? Um, are they holding it up to their eye and looking at it from an unusual angle? So the, the trick with autism though, is, as I said, is it's, it's really variable. So I might see um, one type of behavior in one child, but see a slightly different type of behavior in another child. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not the case that children with autism never make eye contact or they never point. Um, um, there is lots of variability. Some children will have lots of repetitive behaviors where another child might have very restricted interest. Um, so it's a it's an overall profile, um, but it, um, um, it's not an easy diagnosis to arrive um, at because you also are having to take into account that development really is broad range. What a two-year-old can do can really vary, um, and they're making gains at such a rapid pace, um, so they can look very different. Oh, thank you very much. That was excellent. So mo mostly what you're looking for is the contrast between what you would expect from a normal child that age and the variability in, in the like autistic kids who, who are far away from that in a variety of ways. Yes, so, so right. we're comparing, you have to have kind of an understanding of what typical development looks like. Exactly. And that we expect development to progress and then we're looking for variations from that, deviations from that. So for example, the way language typically develops is a child understands a lot before they can speak. Um, so you can, you know, give a child commands, you can use words, you can call their name. They're understanding a lot more before their vocabulary develops. And sometimes mm -hmm. children with autism will see a reverse in that development where they may be using words, but their understanding of language um, and their ability to communicate um, is lagging behind. Uh, so they might be saying square and red and naming all their numbers and letters and being able to label multiple things. But then when they want to ask you for something, they're struggling to be able to do that. Or when you're giving them simple commands, they may struggle understanding those things. Okay. So when we used to talk about receptive and expressive language, yes. right? Okay. Yes. And so it's not the case in every child with autism, but um, it is a, a more frequent profile that we see where those things are reversed, oh, um, oh, okay. um, where they may be using expressive language, but the receptive language is still lagging behind. Oh, all right, okay, well, that's quite a flip. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Maybe right, in the test of time, we will uh, move to the other uh, speaker. Uh, so yeah. Dr. Newsom, thank you very much, and uh, welcome Dr. Uh, Kenna. Rajat, you muted. All right. I hear him. All right. So thank you so much, Dr. Newsom. Um, and I'm going to pick up from um, that part. So I don't. Um, I'm not going to be talking about what autism is. By now, you know very well what that is. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is brain research in, in autism, and primarily I'll, I'll tell you two things today and uh, um, what we do in our lab and in our center um, to learn about the brain in autism and how that can be um, helpful for us in, in diagnosing and treating um, autism. So this is the, what you're looking at is the first um, scientific paper published in the field of autism spectrum disorder. This paper was published in 1943 by a psychiatrist. His name is Leo Kanner uh, from Johns Hopkins University. And, and the paper is called Autistic Disturbances of Affective Contact. And the reason for me to put this here is that um, what Kaner was describing in that paper is lots of different cases who shared um, similar characteristics, which we call now as autistic behaviors. And one of those cases is this person, um, young boy at that time, he was 11 years old, and his name is um, Donald T. So, um, you know, as usual with cases of autism, people wonder, like, you know, what happens when kids with autism become adults, like what kind of struggles they go through. So nobody had any idea about uh, many of the cases um, Kaner described in his paper. And a few years ago, 
couple of reporters from BBC uh, tried to track, you know, where these people were, and they found out uh, that this is Donald T. Now, and he lives in Mississippi and, and comfortably leading uh, a typical life you can imagine. And and. Uh, the reason I'm, I mean, he's probably about 80 something years old right now, I mean, still, still living. And, um, you know, why I put this here is Kenner um, highlights two important things in his paper. Number one is the title of the paper you can see. What is the problem in autism? The problem is in affective contact, like relating to other people emotionally and socially. That's one of the main problems. And second thing Kenner mentioned even at that time is biology. There's something fundamentally different in the biology of these individuals, maybe at the brain level, maybe at the genetic level. Um, this is the instrument which Dr. Newsom was talking a moment ago, which is used for diagnosis. So uh, again, now I'm going to connect all these things we, we were talking about. The first paper was published in 1943, and we are sitting here in 2021. And now we are using, even now we are using this technique called Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, which is this huge kit with a lot of toys and, and uh, books and pictures in it. And we spend, um, with this kit um, about one hour or more than that with uh, children with autism and adults um, to arrive at a diagnosis of autism. So the point is that there is no way to detect autism or diagnose autism very early. Like what, what I'm saying is maybe before two years of age. So is there anything we can do related to that? So that's where two important questions comes into play. So if you ask any family of people with autism, what are the two things, you know, two main things you're concerned about? They would say number one thing would be diagnosis. How early can we identify and accurately diagnose autism? Number two, if my child has autism, what is the treatment for that? Like, you know, what can I, what can, what is the right kind of treatment or intervention, which we call like precision medicine, like getting the right treatment for the right person at the right time? So what's blocking these things? Why can't we uh, identify autism early and why can't we treat early? And that's because we don't have something called biomarkers. Mm. Like you cannot look at the brain of a child with autism and say that you know this child has autism or this child doesn't have autism. And our research has been um, looking at, you know, is there a way to identify biomarkers for um, autism? So I'm gonna tell you two important questions. And number one, the first question we just talked about, can we identify and diagnose autism spectrum disorders early um, in life? Um, so we use a technique called human brain mapping or brain imaging, right? So you, um, we can take people with uh, like live people, we call it in vivo and put it in this giant machine called MRI machine or magnetic resonance imaging. And while the person is inside that machine, you can track their pictures of their brain, the activity of their brain, the connections in the brain and so on and so forth. So we use human brain mapping to understand the structure, function, connections, and, and chemicals in the brain, and so on. So here's a, a quiz sort of thing. Like, you know, there are two brains presented here, healthy brain versus autism. And if I ask you, like, which brain is the healthy brain here? Which brain has autism? And I don't think anybody in this world will be able to tell you which one is which. And why is that? There is no lesion or tumor sitting in the brain of a person with autism. The problem is more subtle and more complex, actually. And that's, that's what makes it a very complicated disorder and complex disorder to, um, to study. And, and we have been trying to use different techniques to understand uh, the brain. And one of those techniques we call functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. And what this technique does is, you know, you can see a lot of different pictures on the left side of your screen here. These are pictures which we use to study social thinking in people with autism. Like you can see on the right-hand side uh, of this screen, there's a point light walker walking actually. So can you look at that walker and tell what kind of temperament that person is? Is that person happy? Is that person sad? Is that person male or female? And so on and so forth. While we are asking these questions, you know, we track the brain activity, how the neurons are firing in their brain. That's what we are looking at. 
And once we look at that, you get these massive activity pictures, which are, um, you know, indicated in these bright colors at the bottom on these brains, you know, in, in different colors. And what we do is you know, we compare that activity in autism as well as in control participants. And we look at how big of a difference is there between uh, those. And, and trying to identify, are these activity differences telling us anything different about autism? And can we use this for um, detecting autism very early? Probably not. You know. So a lot of research has been done in that area and not with, with, with I mean, it, it tells you a lot about the differences in the brain, but not, uh, to the level that we can use it for classifying a group of people into autism and control. There comes another point, you know, I was telling you earlier that we can look at uh, another function or another aspect of brain called connectivity. You can look at uh, this picture here at birth and at six years old and at 14 years old. These are the neuronal connections in the brain. And, and at birth, you know, the connections are not all over the place. It's, it's sporadic, I would say. And, and when, you, when it's at six years of age, the connections are, too many connections are there. And by 14 years of age, I think many of those unwanted connections are cut away through a process called pruning. So brain development goes through a delicate balance of like keeping some connections which are strong and cutting away or pruning some connections which are not um, that strong actually. That makes you uh, function optimally or that makes the brain function optimally. On the right hand side, you're seeing a very interesting study using a technique called diffusion weighted imaging. And what you are looking at there is infant from 107 days old infant, and you're tracking the, the connections in that child's brain from 107 days to 329 days. And you can see, uh, all you need to look at is that red picture at the bottom panel in each of ca those, those cases there. At 107 days, the red patches are very little there, but around 329 days, the red patches are pretty much spreading all over the brain. That means the connectivity is increasing significantly, massively in that window from 107 days to 329 days. So these connections are very important in accomplishing a function in our daily life, actually. So a simple example would be, uh, if there is a task which you're doing, which is very simple, your specialized parts of the brain can take care of that function. But if the complexity of that task increases, you need more people to take care of or more regions to take care uh, of uh, that function. So different parts of the brain should be communicating to each other to take care of that function. So connections are super important in accomplishing complex functions. And, and what we are trying to look at is how these connections are different in people with autism. So these, these two pictures are from a couple of our studies and one at the top, which is in blue color, is looking at what we call functional connectivity, which is nothing but communication between two different parts of the brain. So simply put it, if a brain area called A is active and brain area called B is active, what we are looking at is, are those two brain regions active at the same time? In other words, are they dancing to the same tune or are they just dancing to different tunes? If they are dancing to the same tune, we will see more connectivity or stronger connectivity as you see in this thickness of these lines in the control participants and in autism, you can see the lines are much thinner there. At the bottom part, what you're looking at is what we call the cables in the brain or cable connections or the white matter in the brain. And what you're seeing there is a huge white matter fiber bundle sitting in the brain, which runs from frontal to uh, posterior part of the brain. And we looked at the integrity of that white matter and you see a clear difference in the integrity where the autism participants, which is represented as ASD, is showing poor white matter integrity compared to um, the control participants in there. So this has led to a lot of literature and a theory from our own group proposing that autism uh, may be characterized by disrupted brain connectivity. 
So these connections are there. They are different uh, compared to control participants. They are not functioning in an optimal uh, way to accomplish certain functions. So the bandwidth is probably there, but how the resources are allocated to take care of different functions may be different in there. So this, this uh, talks about the, the brain or disrupted brain, brain connectivity hypothesis or, or theory. Now you can ask me the question, what's the use of this? I find that you know, uh, connectivity of the brain in, in my child is different from typical con control participants. What is the use of this? So what we have been trying to do is to apply this to another level, which addresses our question. Can we use these connectivity measures to classify the participants into two different groups, you know, which can lead to potentially to diagnosis. So we use a technique called machine learning, where what we are doing is we are feeding the computer with the data computer doesn't have any idea which data is autism, which data is control. It goes through the patterns in that and features in that data set. And what it does is it learns the characteristics in that data set and kind of classifies that into two different categories. And in our preliminary study, what we are finding is about 97% accuracy in classifying those participants based on their diffusion tensor imaging connectivity, or I would say the white matter connectivity into autism and control. As you can see here, the blue is control and red is autism, all classified by computer. Now, this brings me back to the question I was asking earlier, can we diagnose autism early? We are, you know, again, you know, um, don't take away from this talk that you know, we can diagnose now by using brain data. We are not anywhere near there, but I think we are taking baby step, steps towards in that direction that you know, uh, how can we use this data very early? Can we scan the brain of a six month old child and look at the brain connectivity and use that for diagnosing that child or supporting or classifying uh, that child from control participants very early? So that's the, that's the first question I asked. The second question, now you have classified, you un understood that connections are different. What can be done if my child has a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder? And there comes the idea of treatment. What kind of treatment is available or intervention is available? So until 1980s, this is, you know, you can imagine 30, 40 years ago, until 1980s, many neuroscientists believed that once the child is born and after two or three years or maybe three, four years, you can't do much to the brain of that child. The brain is already formed and nothing is changing afterwards. But that's a, that's a mistake. And, and, and that was found, you know, there was a major study in 1980s looking at songbirds. And people looked at the brains of these um, songbirds. And what they found out is that there is a particular part of their brain called song nucleus. And the size of that song nucleus increases significantly in spring compared to fall. And why is that? The number of songs sung by these birds in spring is significantly more than that in fall. And that data is telling you that, you know, because of the use of that part of the brain more and more, the size of that part is increasing. So that gave us an idea about plasticity of the brain, the amazing quality of the brain to change itself. And here is a, a very interesting book, if you get a chance, you should read. It's called Proust and the Squid. And, and Marianne Wolf, you know, in that book, a book talks about you know, uh, the point that we were never born to read. Human beings invented reading only a few thousand years ago. And with this invention, we rearranged the very organization of our brain. Reading is one of the single most remarkable inventions in human history. So there was no brain area devoted for reading, actually. And suddenly on the evolutionary, evolutionary scheme of things, reading came about. And what does the brain do? The brain has to allot some of the real estate which was used for something else to take care of this function called reading. And that clearly shows that brain can change, brain can adapt. And that shows the idea of neuroplasticity or brain plasticity. And why am I talking about this? Because there is a group of children with autism who can read very well, but they don't understand what they're reading. Sure. And this is a bad combination to be to have in a classroom because the teachers can think that you know the child is not paying much, putting much effort into uh, the performance. So they can read well, but they are not understanding what they are reading. So we identified a group of such children, and what we tried to do is you know we brought them to Birmingham and ran a lot of studies on them, uh, a lot of tests in a neuropsychological assessment, and we scanned their brain at time point one. 
and we send these children for a very intense intervention. This is called reading intervention, visualizing and verbalizing for language comprehension and thinking. And intervention is four hours per day, five days a week, 10 weeks long, adding up to 200 hours of face-to-face -face instruction. And then after the intervention is over, we brought them back again. We repeated the same thing which we did. We tested them first, and then we put them in the MRI scanner to look, that, look at their brain. And while they are in the scanner, we gave them different tasks to do. And what we are trying to assess is their brain activity and then brain, brain connectivity. And, and by now you, you have figured out that what we are trying to do is, can the intervention change their brain? And here is one of the tasks which we did. Like we told these children, these are uh, children between seven to 13 years of age. They are in the MRI scanner. They are looking at a computer screen and then reading different sentences like this one, for example. Number eight, when rotated 90 degree, looks like a pair of eyeglasses. This is true or false. Addition, subtraction, and multiplication are math skills. Is it true, and, true or false? And what's the difference between these two? The first one has high imagery. You have to imagine number eight, and then you have to perform 90 degree rotation to get to make sure that they look like eyeglasses. Whereas the second one is a garden variety sentence, you know, simple sentence. But what we found is that connectivity between two parts of the brain, which are classically involved in language processing and reading, they are the Broca's area and Wernicke's area. And in this picture, what you're seeing is after intervention, you looked at the, um, the two different groups participated in the intervention and the blue line shows it is thicker compared to the yellow line. The yellow line is a group called weightless control group who did not get the intervention. And then blue line is the one who got the intervention and their connectivity between Broca's and Wernicke's area, two language regions, significantly changes from time point one to time point two, which clearly indicates that something has worked related to the intervention. The same data we looked at in multiple different ways. Here also you can see this is a very complex figure, but one thing I wanted to highlight is again the same two regions, you know, Broca's area here, Wernicke's area here, connectivity is increased, but we found one thing very, very interesting. We did a test outside the scanner and that test is measuring comprehension ability in these children. And what we found is that their comprehension or reading comprehension changed from time point one to time point two. And that change in comprehension predicted their change in connectivity improvement actually. So here is a behavioral test which we are doing and that that test is predicting the brain activity or in brain connectivity differences in them clearly showing that you know plasticity of the brain and how we can address or change the brain as a result of um, intervention so uh, here is um, a, a report on that from autism speaks on our study reading program improves brain connectivity in students with autism and basically the visualizing and verbalizing intervention changes the activity and connectivity from before um, intervention to um, after intervention so the point i want to make before uh, i go uh, to the last part to tie up uh, this thing is um, first point is about the diagnosis can we use biomarker or brain related data to enhance the um, enhance the diagnosis to much earlier and the signs are showing that you know it is very much possible at least we are in the right direction for that if not we have reached there yet at all the second point is about changing the brain or targeting a brain plasticity and changing the brain using intense interventions and that leads me to this study which is another intervention it's called peers training peers is a social interaction training developed at ucla and this is for much older group like adolescents and young adults and as you know uh, in autism, many of these individuals struggle with social interaction. And this is a 14 to 16 week training in how to um, learn the etiquettes of social interaction. And what we are trying to look at is, you know, how the peers training can change the brain from time point one to um, time point two in terms of um, function as well as um, connectivity. The last thing I want to mention is about another study, which we just completed looking at driving in people with autism. This again is another population or, or another subgroup of autism. Not many people worry much about, you know, because these are adults with autism who has uh, 
driver's license, which means they, they drive, but many drivers we see that they don't drive often. Uh, they, they do have um, license and, and mainly because they face a lot of problems actually. And we were trying to look at uh, um, their driving by putting them in a driving simulator. You can see the car here. Uh, this is located um, at UA UAB um, in the transportation lab. And uh, it's an SUV, you can get in there. And once you drive a virtual driving scenario would pull up on the, on the wall. And uh, what we are trying to look at is how people with autism are responding when there is a pedestrian trying to cross the road or any other hazards which are coming. How good are you in anticipating these things? And so we are measuring many of the cognitive and uh, brain processes behind um, um, driving. So um, I, I would stop there, and this is a, a huge group of uh, people in, in the lab, you know, uh, and, and some collaborators facilitating our work and uh, funding agencies from NIH, NSF, and uh, Linda Moodbell Learning Processes who did our um, intervention. And uh, if you have, um, uh, if you're interested in participating or contributing or in any, any other way, uh, have all the information here related to the lab and, and center. So I'm going to stop there and stop sharing the screen and uh, um, take questions at this point. Thank, thank you, uh, Rajan. There's a question in the chat, uh, and that is about, can you use an MRI on a six-month-old baby? Technically, yes. Practically very difficult. <laughs> um, so you can scan, like there are people scanning uh, babies, you know, um, toddlers uh, are scanning is you know, popular. Um, all you are scanning is when they are asleep and the MRI, you know, makes a lot of noise, you know, so that's a, a problem. Uh, but uh, there are labs scanning babies uh, by putting them at sleep around, like in, during their normal sleep time, uh, the babies are brought into the MRI scanner and then look at uh, their brain. And I think, you know, there are labs who are looking at at-risk infants. So uh, if there is a child diagnosed with autism and if there is a sibling, the chances of getting a later diagnosis of autism is much more. So there are labs studying infants, you know, maybe six month old infants, you know, uh, siblings in the scanner to look at brain patterns. Yeah. Okay, it's now time for question. You can ask any question you want. It can be uh, directed at Dr. Kana or Dr. Newsom. I have a question. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. So, uh, so what you're saying is that with the connectivity, that the the functional imaging strategy, you give you give an autistic person a learning task, and then you measure the connectivity, and that was like the the red uh, it showed the red. Uh, I don't know what exactly that was. Brain scan, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and what you're looking for is the people with autism, if, if this could be used diagnostically to differentiate, they would show up with less connectivity in those areas that you were, the uh, uh, Broca's area and, and was it Wernicke's area? Mm -hmm. That's what you're looking for specifically? Yeah. So. Um you know, the connectivity profile is much more complex than, you know, it's not just that one or two regions, and it's also not, uh, it doesn't have a very concrete pattern that if you look at all over the brain, you probably may not see decreased connectivity across all those regions. I think it can vary in terms of where you are looking, and it can vary according to the kind of tasks uh, which you are giving to them. Like one example I would give you is, you know, if you look at relatively posterior part of the brain, like the back of the brain, occipital right. lobe right. and parietal lobe, you may see more connectivity in those regions. If you look at the frontal part of the brain only, you may see more connectivity there. But right. if you look at frontal to posterior connectivity, which are considered as relatively long distance connectivity, you may see less connectivity in those, those regions. So um, what, what makes our task much more complex is this very complex profile of uh, not having a very clear pattern, that it's not like a hard and fast sort of like, you know, a, or a clear cut um, higher connectivity or lower connectivity. I think it varies according to uh, different tasks and, and parts of the brain actually. Uh, okay, yeah, but it's, it's, it's the initial exploration into that, that you could use that once you refine it a little bit. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. I mean, because th uh, there is a lot of uh, I've worked with a lot of 
uh, people with autism, adults and children. Mm -hmm. And uh, the neural typical and atypical, somebody else had used those terms earlier, uh, is, is always very interesting. And there's such great uh, differences between the way people process information. Mm -hmm. Uh, given those factors and it shows up in a lot of different ways and that's just another way with your with your research to start looking into the exact organic uh, neurological issues associated with that because people use the terms but we don't know what's going on inside the head and that's what you're looking at. yes that's right. right okay yeah thank you and there's another question i think this is for uh, dr newsom since microbes seem to have an effect on autism is nutrition addressed with parents or caregivers? Excellent question. Yes, yes. So um, feeding difficulties are actually fairly common in children with autism spectrum disorders. It can be um, a factor related to sensory differences. Um, so having aversions to certain tastes or textures. It can also be an oral motor issue um, where having difficulty with chewing and swallowing um, so children with autism tend to have more limited diets, um, and this may be one of the things that's having an impact on their microbiome. Um, they're not eating as much variety of foods. So that's why feeding therapy is often um, included in part of the kind of therapy package to help increase the variety of foods that, that they're eating. Mm -hmm. Constipation is also a, a frequent issue in children with, with autism as well. Any more questions? Dr. Kana, with your research on the elasticity and the things that you're seeing, that, that thickened connection that happens, um, will there be research that you do to follow up with these same, the same cohort of individuals to see if that thickened connection remains over time or are you are we under the assumption that because now it's been developed and they have that skill that they will continue to use that skill and it will just retain because of newly developed usage and connectivity? Yeah, excellent question, um, Tammy. You know, you know, some of these studies, like the one which I presented, we did not follow up after that second time point. You know, um, but we have we have a new grant right now which we are working on a bigger uh, scale of this study. And uh, we are planning to do a subset of those children um, to come back probably at a third time point and, uh, and look at uh, whether it's lasting for a longer time. You know? I mean, one, one would expect you know, uh, to stay that because they are learning something and um, you know, then the connections are stronger and uh, formed. So uh, the expectation would be for that to remain like that. Uh, but I think you know, it needs to be tested. <laughs> More question? Uh, yes, someone asked at what age would you feel like a child needs, um, like how old of a child, how old does a child need to be before you would diagnose a child with autism, even if you see strong symptoms um, early? So um, um, from a psychologist's perspective at this point, um, we're typically not diagnosing before 12 months of age. Um, we are sometimes, as um, Dr. Kana suggested, following children who are at high risk um, at earlier ages than that. Um, but our diagnostic tools at this point um, go down to about a 12 month developmental level. So um, 18 months is, um, we can feel pretty confident with that. And by two years of age, um, that diagnosis is pretty stable and reliable if we make a diagnosis by that point. So the youngest children I see for to give an official diagnosis is usually between 12 and 24 months. And so some children will be more clear by that point um, and some children um, um, may not be fully um, showing all of the symptoms to reach the diagnostic criteria until closer to three years of age. And then I saw another question a little bit earlier in, in the chat, you know, um, how can we come out of, come out from ASD with therapies or medicines or both together? Cassandra, um, you want to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, um, the, I think it's going to be a combination of things. At this point, we, there is not a medication for autism. 
Um, there is no single drug that we have that actually has been shown to, to treat the core symptoms of, of, of autism or change developmental trajectory. I think that's the hope and the promise um, of precision medicine in the future is that we may be able to find medications that um, more directly target symptoms, but because autism has so many different um, uh, potential causes and the differences that Dr. Khan talked about, um, it's unlikely that there will be one medicine, like one size fits all. Um, we'll probably, more likely be looking at particular genetic differences, trying to understand the underlying mechanisms, how they're driving brain development, how they're coding for different proteins. And we may be able to kind of uh, interrupt that cycle. Um, and there are definitely clinical trials that are going on right now, particularly in rare genetic disorders um, that are trying different medications um, to see if we can interrupt those cycles and, and alter um, the developmental trajectory and treat some of those core symptoms, um, but we're not there yet. And I would say the same for our interventions. Um, the, um, the therapies that we have are good, but they um, um, are not equally effective in all children. So some children will receive intensive ABA therapy and respond um, very well and other children will continue to have very significant symptoms. Um, and so right now we've been trying to do research where we're looking at, okay, for this child with this profile, what types of therapies do we need to put together? How intensive do those therapies need to be? How many hours a week do they need to be? Um, you know, is there something we can use to predict about when the best timing for that intervention is? So how do we know when a child is ready to really benefit from the therapies. So at this point, we're saying, do we tell parents do all of these things, you know, get as much intervention as early as possible, as many hours a week. But um, we're not at the point yet where we can be more precise and targeted. And I think that's um, where the field needs to go and where research is headed is, is being able to be more prescriptive. Um, and targeted in the ways that we do treatments. Right now, we're kind of throwing the kitchen sink at it and, and, and doing as much as possible. Yeah, just, just to follow up that, that point, you know, uh, intervention works. So if anybody who has a child with autism out there, intervention really works like magic and, and early intervention works even better. A classic example of that is, you know, Do Dr. Newsom had this quote of Temple Grand in there, you know, Temple Grandin was diagnosed as a severely autistic child, you know, and uh, you know, now she has a PhD, she has written several books, you know, she, uh, you know, she leads a typical life, you know, and her mother has very detailed account of that in, in her books, you know, talking about how uh, persistent and continuous intervention has worked wonders with uh, Temple Grandin, you know. So, so I think, you know, there's definitely, you know, a lot of, you know, um, hope with the intervention. Um, of course, we don't have targeted treatment, but that's okay. But intervention is definitely out there. Yeah. yeah. The best predictor of a good outcome is early diagnosis and early intensive intervention. Mm -hmm. That's our goal at this point is, can we intervene while the brain is still de developing, making new connections, and can we alter the course of development? and improve, just improve the quality of life for people with an autism spectrum disorder and their families. Maybe one more question. Um, you, I know um, I saw the slides, but it, for insurance, for um, autistic intervention and treatments, how easy is it for insurance to cover these for people who really need to take advantage of this? Um, so it can definitely be challenging. Um, Alabama in the um, last few years has approved ABA therapy um, before, uh, maybe five, 10 years ago, it was not necessarily covered by insurance, particularly by uh, Medicaid. Um, it is now covered by Medicaid. Um, and there are, for children who have Medicaid in, in um, Alabama, there was actually a lawsuit over this and there is now funds set aside to help families coordinate um, care um, and be able to get access to those treatments and therapies. So um, 
Um, lots of states have um, mandates now that insurance cover autism. Autism often in the past was um, an exclusionary pre-existing condition. One of those things that if you had autism, you actually were not eligible for these um, types of services. Um, and through a lot of legislative work, um, there has been a push towards understanding that these are services that are needed, they're imperative and they need to be covered. But there is a big financial toll on families um, to, um, in, in trying to access these therapies. It's very expensive. We're talking about many hours a week of therapy over many years. Um, and insurance is definitely not going to cover as much as we're typically recommending um, children receive. Um, and there's also similar to that there's not enough people trained to do diagnosis. There's also not enough people trained to do these particular types of specialized treatments. Um, so they're often long waiting list for families to get access to those services. Um, ABA therapy, um, um, the people who provide ABA therapy, behavioral analysts just recently were able to be licensed in the state of Alabama over the last few years to be able to bill insurance. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, one more question, yeah, this, this is actually just to mention, I placed in the chat box a uh, flyer for the Department of Mental Health um, Intensive Services phone line and it, it's a flyer from them. So if uh, you wanna ch click on that PDF, it will get you a flyer that gets you information to connect. Thank you very much for doing yeah. that. This is really fantastic. So I, just, I want to really thank our, our, our speakers today. This was really very good talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And it looks like we had plenty of questions showing that it was also well received. So thank you very much for doing this. As, as I mentioned, thank you. Um, it will be available uh, you know, on our website, on the CNC website, and also at your local library. And I hope to see you next month uh, where uh, two other scientists speak about sleep and circadian uh, cycles. And then after that, April, remember COVID, COVID, everything you want to know about COVID by, you know, superb researcher. Dr. Mazzaro has been, you know, on CNN, on, you know, on different uh, platforms speaking about COVID. So she's really well known and we're very lucky to have her uh, come and speak to us. So uh, I'm going to wish you a good evening and thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Bye-bye, everybody.